Welcome to A Popular History of Unpopular Things, a mostly scripted podcast that makes history more fun and accessible. My kind of history is the unpopular stuff. Disease, death, and destruction. I like learning about all things bloody, gross, mysterious, and weird. And today, I want to talk about the Irish potato famine. Most of you probably know a little bit about it already. It was a crop disease called blight that swept through Ireland in the mid-19th century and destroyed almost all of the crops. And as a result, the Irish starved. Many of them died, but even more emigrated to the United States to escape the poverty and the starvation happening in their home country. And that's all true, but I want to dig deeper. The Irish potato famine is one of the great social failures of the 19th century, that's the 1800s, and I want to explain why. Where did the blight come from? Did it only affect the Irish? And if blight was elsewhere, why were the Irish the ones so badly affected, right? Was it only potatoes? And if so, why were there not alternative food sources? And how bad did it really get during the peak years of the famine? So today, I'm going to give you a more in-depth look at the horrors of the Irish potato famine. And you know I love me some gross history, so I'll give you an insight into how bad it got. Um, but it was more than just the loss of potato crops for a few years. It was the culmination of bad British economic and social policies, population overgrowth, and the clash of two worlds, the agricultural world and the industrial world. Mix in some bad luck with the arrival of blight at just the wrong time, and we end up with a catastrophic event that resulted in over a million deaths. And when you factor in emigration to the U.S., the Irish population shrank by a third. These are population decreases similar to what we saw with the Black Death, when about a third of all peoples who came in contact with the plague, from Asia to the Middle East to Europe, died. The consequences of such a population drop would be felt for a long time, socially, politically, economically, and culturally. So today, we're going to take a look at the Irish potato famine and try to understand how quickly things can go wrong and also how gross crop failures can be. So as is custom with the AFALP podcast, we first need to take a look at the historical context to get a better understanding of what is happening here. What was going on in Ireland in the years leading up to the potato famine that helps explain why it went so horribly, horribly wrong, right? Historical context is always one of the most important things in history. Now, the peak years of the Irish potato famine were from 1845 to 1847, but it carried on until 1852. But to get a better sense of the factors that contributed to the crisis, we need to rewind the clock a little bit. Now, we know that blight is the reason for potato crop failure, but how did Ireland get so reliant on one crop to begin with? How does Ireland get to a point where its survival hinges on this one thing, right? The famine is not just an Ireland problem, so let's take a look at its really contentious history with my ancestral people, the British, to get a better sense of what's going on. And honestly, we really, really messed this one up. So Ireland has always been seen as lesser, unfortunately, in Britain's eyes. And it wasn't just Ireland, mind you. The English have a long imperial history of conquering others and forcing their social, economic, and cultural systems on their newly conquered peoples because they thought them best. Or at least a huge improvement over what was... over the ways, rather, their conquered peoples were living. Ireland was no exception to British imperialism, and to be clear... This line of thinking is absolute garbage, okay? Forcing your beliefs on someone at any scale, person to person, country to country, because you think your way is better than their way, that's an awful thing to do. We don't do that. It's 2023. But let's keep digging deeper here. If we go back to the Tudor period of English history, there was always this obsession with crushing Irish independence and taking over. Now, the Tudors, you may recognize the name perhaps, it's the one with famous monarchs like Henry VIII with his six wives, right? Or maybe Elizabeth I. Now, at the time, the most rebellious Irish stronghold was Ulster, which is that whole northern chunk that you would recognize as the Northern Ireland part of the UK today. And I'm glossing over a very long history here, but essentially, by the time Elizabeth and her successor James I were done with it, the area was no longer a cultic stronghold, but a bastion of English law and power. Now, later, 
In the mid-17th century, that's the 1600s, Oliver Cromwell came over with an army of more than 400,000 people and intended on taking control of Ireland in the name of the British Parliament, not the Crown. It's a long story involving the English Civil War, the beheading of Charles I, and the fight over how Britain should be governed. That's a story for another day. But for Ireland, this meant that again the British had their sights on taking power. Now, death toll from Oliver Cromwell's campaign ranged dramatically, but historians estimate anywhere between 15 to 50 percent of indigenous Irish died. And when you have a massive population drop like that, a few things happen. One, the economy essentially shuts down as there just aren't enough people working. There's not enough laborers. Makes sense to me, right? Workers are all dying, so goods aren't being produced, so the economy basically stops in its tracks. And as a result, Ireland experienced famines, which is prolonged periods of time where there's not enough food, because there just wasn't enough food being produced. No workers, no food, right? Makes sense. The second thing that happened, was, which was Britain's goal, by the way, was an influx of British and Scottish settlers that came into the now much emptier Ireland. It should be... No surprise to hear that the Irish are not big fans of Oliver Cromwell. Now, by the end of the 17th century, again, that's the end of the 1600s, the number of Brits living in Ireland jumped from 2% up to 29%. And only 50 years later, so 1750, the middle of the 18th century, almost 95% of land in Ireland was owned by British or Scottish settlers. 95% of the land owned not by the people who originally lived there. It's crazy. So hopefully, you're getting the bigger picture here, that the British systematically subjugated the Irish and took over their land. Mm. But it went beyond that. British laws stripped Irish Catholics of the right to freely practice their religion. This is another throwback to the English Civil War, and frankly, a wider dispute between the Protestants and Catholics happening throughout Europe in general in the 17th century. I think I touched on this briefly in the Lost Roanoke Colony and the Dancing Plague episodes, so go check those out. Now, the British also denied them of the right to own firearms, those are weapons, purchase or inherit estates, own horses, and lease large quantities of land. So again, we see that they want to take over the land, prevent the people from being able to do anything about it, right? No guns, no horses, nothing, and maintain control. By the 1770s, the Irish are starting to talk about independence an independent Irish state, free of British influence and control, where they can practice their religion freely, own land, and make their own decisions. Does that sound familiar to you? The 1770s? Independence? Getting rid of the British? I'm hoping you can pick up on the parallels here to the American Revolution, but for the Irish, it was a lot harder. For one, they are geographically right next to Britain, We're over 3,000 miles away across an ocean. Talks of independence in Ireland calmed down for a bit during several conflicts with France. First, there was the Anglo-French War, which started in 1793, which bled into the Napoleonic Wars when Napoleon took power, which eventually ended in 1815. And throughout these years, the Irish economy grew as their agricultural production basically helped supply the British war effort. A stronger, growing economy meant that times were good. And typically, when times are good and the economy is strong and trending upwards, we see massive population growth. All right? From 1745 to 1800, the Irish population doubled from 2.5 million people to 5 million people. And then from 1800 to 1845, the beginning of the Irish potato famine, it almost doubled again, going from 5 million to 8.2 million people. But hey, listen, Ireland is a small place. There are only so many places to live, right? I mean, Ireland's population today is only a smidge over 5 million and 6 million when you count Northern Ireland, which is actually part of the UK. But this rapidly growing population made Ireland a really densely crowded place. There's less and less land available, and when we consider British and Scottish settlers were taking most of that land anyway, and British laws prohibited the Irish from owning too much, it's not a good combination. Now, another big change that's happening around this time is industrialization. The Industrial Revolution was kind of in its early stages. Goods made in factories were much, much cheaper than handmade goods. Let's think about this with an example. So let's say you live in a small village, 
you want to purchase a blanket for your home. So you go to the local shop and you purchase a blanket that good old Mary stitched up herself. Not only are you paying for the cost of the, t the materials Mary used to make that blanket, but you're paying for her time and her labor as well. The time it took Mary, the textile artisan, to make that blanket. Great. And it's beautiful. Full of old Celtic charm. Good old Mary, right? But nowadays, realistically, do any of you go to sites like Etsy to purchase a handmade blanket? Or do you go to your local craft fair or vendor show to purchase homemade goods like that? Most of you? No. No, you don't. You either go to Target or some other chain store that sells home decorating goods, right? Or you buy it off Amazon or Wayfair because it's cheaper, it's convenient, we like it, it's great. Kohl's, by the way, has cute dog patterned ones, super soft. Those are pretty good too. So over time, my point is there will be fewer artisan makers and small business owners because it's cheaper and easier to buy from bigger stores, right? Walmart wins, Walmart takes over. Now, on the verge of the industrial world, we see this with cottage industries versus factories. When times were good and Ireland was thriving in the early part of the 19th century, that's the 1800s, the local economies were doing just fine. But when the wars with France ended in 1815, things changed for Ireland. The demand for Irish goods dropped because the war was done, right? But the population was still rising, and this led to a collapse in local economies. Old Mary, your local blanket weaver, isn't going to be able to sell as many blankets as she once did because instead people will buy the cheaper option. In this case, British textiles made bulk in a factory, made in bulk in a factory. Machines are speeding up the process, so they produce a lot of blankets in a single period of time, right? And they can be sold for cheaper and still turn a profit. So why spend four to five times more money on a handmade blanket when you can get more or less the same thing for significantly cheaper? Industrialization usually wins. Now, politically, Britain had already decided that it could not allow Ireland to become an autonomous state. They wanted cheaper access to all those foodstuffs they were buying during the war. And not only did they think that Irish independence was economically untenable, but Ireland also posed a strategic danger being right next to Britain. Enemies could, and by the way, attempted to, use Ireland to get to Britain to crush them. So, on January 1st, 1801, Britain passed the Acts of Union, formally creating the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. The UK was officially born. Now, this population increase and dwindling economy meant a few things for any surviving Irish landowners. First, farms start popping up in really weird places that you wouldn't consider to normally be good farmland, right? Like on the sides of mountains, on the tops of cliffs, bordering the sea where the soil is all kind of sandy anyway. It's not ideal, but frankly, they were running out of room. Second, with the economy in shambles, landowners needed to raise the rent to cope. Remember, the landowners are mostly English and, and Scottish settlers, right? So they needed to raise the rent to cope. And to help save on costs, they also would portion off their lands into smaller chunks, meaning there was typically less land uh, to grow food. And for the Irish farmer, especially the ones who did own their own properties, his land was his livelihood. This was still the age of what we call subsistence farming. Subsistence farming is growing or producing food for the, por for the purpose of feeding yourself and your family. You're not growing it to sell for a profit, you're growing it to live, right? So if you happen to have extra food, you might trade it with a neighbor for whatever they grow, if it's something different, or maybe you'll bring it to town and you'll sell it at the local market. But primarily you're doing it to eat, subsistence farming. You're doing it for survival. If you have a smaller plot of land because of the crumbling economy, it's all you can afford, you're producing less food, right? Less land, less food, nice and easy. And forget the fancy stuff, by the way, like milk or butter or meat or eggs. Raising livestock is expensive and requires a large chunk of land for grazing, especially with cows. So no, most people are growing crops that are cal calorie dense and easy to grow. The good old Irish staple, the potato. Why potatoes, right? Like I said, they're more calorie dense, way more calorie dense than grain, which means you get fuller faster with a smaller quantity of food. Making bread, because you can't just eat straight grain wheat by itself, that's weird. Making bread requires more ingredients than just mashing together those stalks of wheat. For those of you who don't bake, you at minimum, like the most basic recipe, you need yeast, salt, flour, and water. 
Um, if you want softer bread, like you want to make your own sandwich loaf bread, you're also going to need milk, some kind of fat, and sugar. So bread costs more, frankly, to produce than potatoes. With a spud, you just need to cook it. Boil them, mash them, stick them in a stew, right? Now, a single acre of potatoes, which for my fellow Americans is slightly smaller than an American football field, can produce six tons of potato, which is enough to feed a family of six for a year. So as long as you had an acre of land and were diligent in growing your potatoes, you could survive. Life would be a meager existence, but you'd make it. The British, though. It was bad enough that they were slowly taking over all of the land in Ireland, but they took one look at this meager way of life that the Irish were living and were horrified. This is the imperial era, right? The British saw the Irish as poor and filthy, living in squalor, and to make matters worse, they blamed the Irish for the state of affairs because they thought that they were poor, not because of economic policies, but because they were unproductive as people and had no work ethic. We're, we're looking at a period with lots of stereotyping and racism here. Now, we know that the Brits took over and made Ireland part of the UK at the turn of the 19th century. That's the beginning of the 1800s. And in a continuation of their imperialism, the British decided to modernize Ireland. If they could make it more like Britain, life would be better for them, right? That's just your classic imperialism. It's the notion that our way of life is better than your way of life. So we'll take over your country and we'll change everything for you. And you can be great, just like us, as long as you do everything that we do the way that we do it or else. Maybe we'll even let you rule yourselves one day if you can prove to us that you know how to look after yourself. Whew, don't even get me started on my imperialism rant. Oh, boy. Now... Britain thought that they could modernize and, quote, fix Ireland if they shifted the Irish economy away from, subsist away from subsistence farming to commercial farming. Basically, we'll make it so that the Irish work for, well, British farms, producing goods to sell, collecting a wage, and then using that wage to buy the things that they need in life. The British thought this would help them become more productive, and it would also potentially lessen the Irish dependence on potatoes. This commercialization of agriculture, the British were sure, would help lift the Irish out of poverty. Smaller Irish subsistence farms that couldn't keep up would be replaced with commercial ones. So how did the Irish feel about all this, you may be wondering. Well, when there are population pressures, economic tension, discrimination, you usually get social rebellion. Look to the causes of any revolution or rebellion in history, big or small, and you'll see what I mean. Now, protest groups came out against the British policies in Ireland, and one of the most memorable ones were the Molly Maguires, who worked to defend the poor subsistence farmers and farm workers from the might of British imperialism. But the Molly Maguires would terrorize public officials and landowners who slighted the Irish workers. They would threaten them publicly, run their cows off of cliffs, kill their hunting dogs, and set their horses on fire. Yikes. I mean, I'm all for fighting for equality and all in a better life, standing up for the force, uh, against the forces of imperialism and injustice, but not if it means slaughtering innocent animals, and especially dogs. You don't ever hurt the dog. Just ask John Wick. To recap, the British essentially wanted to bring capitalism to Ireland. They figured that if they made the Irish into wage earners, they would then spend their money. On what? Well, first, food, to feed themselves and their families. This would allow for the growth of shops in more rural areas. And if people have money from working, they'll spend it. That's just the way things are. The Brits also hoped it would help reduce the Irish dependence on potatoes. No more subsistence farms, no more homegrown food. The Irish will have to work, make money, and then spend it on British imported goods or commercially grown stuff that you can get at the farm. So in simpler terms, we'll take away the Irishman's farm, which he uses to grow food to eat, and instead he can work on our farm making money to purchase the food that he needs to eat. Oof. Remember, the British are trying to modernize what they deemed as a backward Irish society. And then, into all of this chaos, this subjugation, this uncertainty, a crop disease made its way into Ireland, threatening to destroy the only thing the Irish people had left to survive on, their potatoes. Now, 1845 was a particularly wet and cold year. Heavy summer rains allowed for growth and propagation of Phytophthora 
infestans. It's a fungus that is more commonly known as potato blight. When a potato gets infected with blight, the leaves will start to develop white spots. Now, for those of you who don't already know this, the potato is a tuber. In this case, it's the root of the plant. And like lots of other root vegetables, the potato grows in the soil, and the stems and leaves are what you see above ground. When the leaves of the potato plant turn yellow and brown, which is normal, they start dying off, basically. That's when you know the potato is ready for harvest. It's more complicated than that, and it also depends on the variety of potato, but you get the idea. You plant the potato, wait for the stem and leaves to grow. When the stem and leaves die off, the potato is ready for harvest. Nice and simple. Unless it gets infected by some sort of disease, like the fungusy potato blight. Now, once the leaves start getting white spots, you're in trouble. Those spots will develop on the edges of the leaf and then turn brown as fungus spores develop. And as the infection travels inwards, it will start to attack the stem. The potato stalks will start to wither and wilt and turn black and rotten. And after that, the infection travels down into the roots of the, the plant, the potato itself, right? And the potato will start to rot in the soil and it smells just awful. I hope that you've never had to smell a rotting potato before. I have, unfortunately. Maybe you've left a bag of spuds sitting in the pantry for too long and one gets stuck in the bottom corner, right, and it's not aerated properly and it gets all gross and rotten. Oh man, it is awful. I don't know how or why potatoes smell so evil when they rot, but it is a very distinct and nasty smell. It's one of those smells that make you reflexively gag. It's, it's pretty nasty stuff. Now, with blight, sometimes the potatoes will just stay really small. They don't grow up properly at all, but other times the potato will be full-sized but all slimy on the outside. And when you cut it open, blight potatoes ooze this reddish-brown mucus that just smells like potato death. If potatoes develop blight, there's no saving it. You just have to cut off all the potato growth above the soil and burn it to stop it from spreading. Nowadays, you can prevent it by spraying a copper-based fungicide on the leaves. The leaves, by the way, you don't dig it up and put it on the potato, that'd be weird. Or you can use a fungal-resistant strain of potato, but that stuff's not available in 1845. And for an Ireland that depends pretty heavily on the potato for subsistence, the blight was a death sentence. So in 1845, right, we have an Ireland with a large and growing population, but a declining economy. The British are trying to take over, so farmers on average have smaller farms, which means they are producing less food. Then, with prolonged summer rains, the blight made its way over from the mainland. It started off with farmers in Flanders, which is in Belgium. They noticed the smell of blight and watched helplessly as their potatoes just rotted in a matter of days, sometimes overnight. And if one potato had blight, it would most often spread to the entire field, so the entire harvest was doomed. And when all was said and done, almost 87% of Belgium's potatoes died off in the years around the potato famine. Soon enough... Blight was spreading east into Germany, west into France, and in June of 1845, it hopped from Normandy on the French coast to English farms on the Isle of Wight, which is in the English Channel. And it wasn't long before it made its way north and then west across English farms before jumping into Ireland in the fall. Now, for England, the failing potato harvest was bad, but England's economy was bolstered by industry. And anyway, English agricultural workers earned wages that they could use to buy other foods. So it was a hardship, but it was survivable. But for Ireland, the English commercial agricultural system and using wages to buy food at shops hadn't fully caught on yet. More than half the population depended on subsistence potato farming for food. So, if the potato crops failed, the people would starve. Period. Full stop. End of story. People are gonna die. But again, there wasn't anything anyone could do at that point to stop the spread of blight. It's a fungus. Fungal spores can travel in the wind, or they get picked up by water and rain down. They spread, they travel very quickly. Go play or watch The Last of Us. All right? But unlike in The Last of Us, we don't turn into clicking mushroom monsters by eating blight fungus. You're not going to die if you eat a blighted potato. I mean, I don't recommend trying it because it smells like death and it's all oozy and rotten and your guts will be squishy and gross for quite a while. But just have the satisfaction of knowing that we won't get infected with the blight, only potatoes.
and also tomatoes. Tomatoes can get blight too. Where was I? Right. Blight is in Ireland now, okay? 1845, the fall. And it's not looking so good for the subsistence farmers who rely on potatoes to survive. Initially, lots of mixed reports. Is blight in Ireland? Is it not? Are only some farms being affected? Lots of mixed messages. Of course, the English were trying to downplay it because they don't want the Irish to panic. Now, in September, people weren't too worried about it because the weather was pretty dry, and they had heard from continental European farmers that it was the wet that hastened the spread of fungus. But October brought really heavy rains to Ireland, and the public started to get more anxious, and it was almost potato harvest time, and it seemed like blight was advancing pretty rapidly from farm to farm, town to town across Ireland. The particular and peculiar smell of blight became too strong to ignore, and as the October harvests began, farmers were pulling rotten potatoes from the ground. There was no denying it now. Blight was in Ireland, and it would threaten the entire Irish way of life. One farmer wrote the following to his children living in Boston in the U.S., quote, The beginning of the harvest was very promising. The crops had a very rich appearance, and it was generally expected that next season would be very plentiful. But within the last few weeks, it is dreaded that nothing less than a famine must prevail. A disease has seized the potato crop, which was the standing food of the country. The potatoes, which were good and healthy a few days since, are now rotten in the ground, even some which were dug in beautiful dry weather. The newspapers teem with alarming accounts of the same disease throughout the kingdom. Parliament has been called upon to assemble to devise means for providing against the dreaded calamity. End quote. Now, typically, when big things happen like this that threaten a way of life, things can get ugly. There were already a lot of tensions between the English and the Irish, and the impending famine only exacerbated it. Protestants blamed Catholics, Catholics blamed Protestants, the English blamed the Irish way of life, the Irish blamed the English takeover of their lands, violence erupted, bands of criminals formed and terrorized Irish and British citizens alike. As I said, things got pretty ugly. Now, to alleviate the crisis, Parliament eventually, after a few years, repealed the Corn Laws, which charged a high tax on grains, making it generally more expensive to buy things like wheat or corn. It's part of the reason why potatoes were so prevalent in Ireland, right? Potatoes were cheap. They're easy to grow and maintain, so potatoes become the bulk of the Irish diet, especially for poor Irish tenant farmers working on lands owned and rented out by English and Scottish owners. But making other grains cheaper didn't stop the problem. Potato crops were failing, and the people were starving. This would be like, I don't know, if you cut off your finger, right? And you just put a whole ton of gauze on your finger. Is it going to stop the bleeding? After a while, yeah. But putting a ton of gauze on your finger isn't going to bring your finger back, right? If it's severed off, it's gone. You can't fix the problem once it's already happened. Now, to make matters worse, because of course they got worse, Ireland was still exporting foodstuffs to Britain like they did back during the war. Now, in the midst of this crisis, this famine, the I Irish were still supporting the English public with food. So while farmers were starving because their subsistence potato crops were rotting in the fields, they were still expected to farm and send off to England things like grains, peas, beans, rabbits, fish, honey, milk, butter, all things that Ireland was expected to produce and send away, despite the famine. Not nuts. So what could be done with the rotting potatoes then? Because that's clearly all they have left. Now, at one point, a pamphlet was sent out advising the Irish to buy this fancy grater of sorts that could help them shave off the good chunks of potato from the rotten bits. This is just capitalism at its finest. These people are starving and dying from a lack of food and are still expected to send most of their farm goods to England. But if they buy this one tool worth more than a week's wages, by the way, they can make good use of those rotten potatoes. That's ridiculous. Oh, and the pamphlet ended, by the way, with, quote, We are confident that all true Irishmen will exert themselves and never let it be said that Ireland, the inhabitants, lacked the courage to meet difficulties. End quote. So, why were the British not letting the Irish keep their food exports? Why not stop so the Irish could survive instead? Well, unlike Ireland, 
England was in the middle of the Industrial Revolution and had many more factory workers in need of cheap food. To the British in charge of Ireland, that was reason enough not to stop the food exports. But it was at the cost of many Irish lives. And it also didn't help that the English started to view the Irish as poor because of some defect of character, which made it easier, frankly, to dehumanize them. Anti-Irish language and sentiments were, unfortunately, everywhere. By January 1846, the real hunger started to set in. What little potatoes weren't diseased were now running out, and some potatoes were kept as seed potatoes for next year's harvest. Here's some agricultural knowledge for you, or as some of my AP Human Geography kids used to say, we're going to do some ag. So seed potatoes aren't seeds, all right? They're just potatoes used for planting. And it's a bit weird, but potatoes reproduce from other potatoes. Now, the potato is actually just a tuber, which is like a little nutrition bank. We like it. It's tasty. It fries up nicely into chips. Can't really go wrong with a spud. But this tuber nutrition bank in nature is used to produce a new potato crop. Now, if you've ever left a potato sitting around for a long, it grows what we call eyes, right? Little sprouts that, if left, will shoot up and become new plants, which will produce more roots with more little potato tubers on them. So if you grow potatoes, save about 5 to 15% of that crop to use as seed potatoes for next harvest. They sprout those little stems, those eyes. If you plant them, the magic will happen. And garlic, spring onions, and ginger also work like this, by the way. I love growing garlic. It's super easy. You just plant it in the ground and it produces more garlic. And animals don't like the smell of it either, so they don't really mess with it, which I appreciate. Now, at the same time that the hunger was getting bad, prices started to rise. So people who were making tiny little wages were having a harder time getting their hands on enough food. Potatoes on sale in Belfast went from three pence to six and a half pence. And it wasn't just food either. Rent, clothes, even fuel for fires and cooking were becoming more expensive. So what did people eat if they had no potatoes and no money for food? Well, whatever they could find, really. First, they resorted to eating the diseased potatoes. I sure hope nobody wasted money on that stupid peeler from the pamphlet, but parents would often go without so that their children would eat. Now, remember that there were other things growing in Ireland, like oats and corn and wheat. Cows were producing milk, so they were making butter and cheese as well, and then the cows would be slaughtered for their meat. There were sheep, there were pigs, chickens were laying eggs. And imagine the resentment that the Irish must have been feeling when they saw their hard-earned crops and animal products being brought to the coast, loaded into ships bearing the Union Jack, which is the name for the UK's flag. Now, to try to help, the English decided to purchase corn, what they called Indian corn, which is maize from the Americas, to give out to the people. Government corn, it was called. And it would be sold for cheap to the Irish, and there were various systems in place for distributing, out throughout the, for distributing, distributing it throughout the country. But those systems, as you can imagine, were not very well thought out. There was no proper way to distribute what little food England was supplementing to Ireland. And if you're thinking, well, it's not actually their job to help the Irish, I will remind you that the English had taken over much of the land, forced it to join the UK, controlled its economy, and exported food out of a starving Ireland for its own benefit. So... They made that mess, they needed to help fix it. But as time went on, more and more people were starving. The Irish had lived through famines before, so they had gotten used to stockpiling different reserves of food. But those were running out, and the potatoes in reserve were going rotten in storage anyway, so they were getting desperate. Some people would steal from farms at night that weren't filled with blight. Some would drink the blood from the neck of cows. They would boil seaweed if they lived near the coast. They would eat grass and nettles growing on the side of the road. They would climb down dangerously steep, basically vertical cliffs to grab seagull eggs. And this was in the early years of 1846. Remember that the famine would continue realistically until 1852, when the potato crop finally bounced back. So, seven years of starvation. 
Now, men and women bartered whatever they could with local shops, if they existed, sometimes literally the clothes on their backs. And as things got progressively worse, people got increasingly desperate, doing what they needed to do to feed themselves and their families, like robbing stores, or rioting against local officials, becoming more militant. Attendance in groups like the Molly Maguire's Rose, you know, the ones who fought back against poor working conditions for Irish tenant workers and farmers, although they did it in a really violent way. With literally no alternative, many turned to crime to survive. At the same time, some English landowners were evicting their Irish tenants, fearing violence and theft. So even more people were driven out onto the streets with no employment, no shelter, no food, no possessions, no money to buy any of the above, nothing. Driven desperate from hunger, some turned on and robbed what relief wagons were out distributing government corn, making the whole situation worse for everyone in the long run. By the summer of 1846, many towns were running out of the relief food, so even if people had managed to scrape enough money together to purchase some, there was none to be had. Now, blight wreaked even more havoc on the 1846 harvest, so things continued to get worse. The people were already beyond starving, and now they faced more crop failings. In 1845, around five-eighths of the potato harvest across Ireland had failed, had contracted blight. But in 1846, that number rose to around three-quarters, if not more, of the potato harvest. And please keep in mind that Ireland was still exporting large quantities of food to England. You know, things that could have stayed in Ireland and fed the people. Blight had also gotten worse for other European potato farmers, too, so the precious stock of government corn coming over from the Americas dwindled as Belgian, Dutch, French, and German merchants lobbied for some of those shares. And what little corn did make its way into Ireland was now more expensive as a result, leading to an even greater famine. And with the continued famine came more violence as the people got increasingly desperate. By December 1846, the death rates started to spike. One visitor in a Cork city wrote the following of what they saw. Quote, All the wealthier streets and places of resort are literally in the possession of the most squalid and wretched human beings. These creatures wander restlessly up and down the streets, now clustered in groups, besetting the entrance of every shop, surrounding every person with clamorous importunities. Under gateways, miserable creatures lay in extreme exhaustion. Six persons died in the streets in the night I passed through. End quote. Everywhere you look in Ireland, people were dying. And with the squalid conditions people were forced to live in, disease started to spread too. Famine fevers, dysentery, typhus, all the usual suspects. What few workhouses existed in Ireland were also hotbeds of disease, so those at the mercy of the awful workhouse system weren't that much better off. I went into more detail about workhouses in my episode on Jack the Ripper, so go listen to that if you're interested in how bad they were. So it's no surprise, given all of his death and misery, that those who were able to leave Ireland left. Now, a source notes that, quote, Of the thousand human beings taking their departures from here, a great majority are well-dressed and comfortable-looking farmers and the better class of peasantry who are carrying away with them no inconsiderable share of the wealth of the country. End quote. Those with money to leave left, basically. And the economy of Ireland tanked even more because of it. There's no spending, right? The more well-off farmers and tradesmen were fleeing as fast as they could. In the entirety of 1846, uh, uh, 116,000 people emigrated or moved out of Ireland. But by just the spring of 1847, after the starvation started to get really, really bad, 365,000 had left. 215,000 went to North America, both the US and Canada, and the rest went to Britain. And after a while, it wasn't just the middle classes and the well-off peasants. More and more of the really rural Irish, the ones who still spoke Gaelic and rarely ventured more than a few miles from home, were talking about Albany, New York, or Boston, or Philly. England's response? Well, according to John Kelly, who wrote a history of the famine called The Graves Are Walking, quote, in England, where depopulation was widely viewed as a necessary precondition for the modernization of Ireland, the outflow was cheered. 
The Times predicted a second plantation of Ireland by thrifty Scot and scientific English farmers, men with means, men with modern, modern ideas. In a few years more, a Celtic Irishman will be as rare in Connemara as the Native American on the shores of Manhattan. End quote. That didn't end up being true, of course, but what we learned from that passage is that the English were happy to see the Irish flee their own country because it meant they had more opportunities to take over. Irish towns were depopulating and ended up deserted almost overnight. It began in 1846, but the real bulk of emigrations happened in the early months of 1847 when all hope was truly lost and it was either leave or die. I'll quote John Kelly again because I like this passage. Quote, the desire to go was so powerful, people left without luggage, without money, without forethought, without shoes. They left in unsafe ships. They left from little used, ill-equipped ports like Westport and Mayo and Kinsale and Cork. They left on ships that had fought through the French wars, and they left without sea stock, the extra provisionals essential for the typical eight weeks' crossing in an emigrant vessel. The people standing on the wharves wondered why, in God's name, anyone would want to stay. End quote. Now, certainly, life in a new country without any money, supplies, belongings, or plans was difficult, and the treatment that many Irish men, women, and children faced when they arrived in America was just awful. But that's a story for another day. But those who had survived up to that point in the Irish potato famine, fleeing was the only alternative. The other thing that waited for them back home in Ireland was death. Instances of blight continued to pop up until 1852 when the potato harvest started to bounce back. The peak years, though, were 1845 to 1847, and during this time, the Irish population dropped by 2 to 3 million people. Over a million died, and somewhere between 1 and 2 million emigrated. It led to changes in English penal laws and taxes, a rise in calls for Irish independence from the UK, and a massive diasporic population of Irish people living outside of Ireland, primarily in North America. The event was labeled the Great Famine, and it gives historians an interesting look into the friction between an industrial imperial world and the agricultural world. Britain, the industrial imperial aggressor, took over Ireland, an agricultural nation, and though they planned to, quote, modernize the country and remake it in Britain's image, they failed. What happened instead was a rise in social tension, economic pressure, and political chaos. And when blight made its way into Ireland, the country was already a ticking time bomb. A threatened food supply made the whole situation explode. In the 1850s, Ireland started to bounce back. Irish farms grew larger, agricultural profits increased. In the 1870s and 1880s, they fought the Land War, which reversed many of the things England had done years ago in preventing the Irish from owning too much of their own land. And by the beginning of the 20th century, that's the 1900s, more than half of Irish land was once again owned by the Irish, as opposed to English or Scottish settlers. But despite a hard-fought victory against the potato famine and English imperialism, the relationships between Ireland and Britain remained fractured. In the years following World War I, the Irish Republican Army, or the IRA, started to fight back against the British. Ireland eventually won its independence from Britain, with the exception of the heavily Protestant Northern Ireland, which remains part of the UK to this day. Thanks for joining me for this episode of A Popular History of Unpopular Things. My name is Kelly Beard, and I hope you've enjoyed the story of the Irish potato famine. Thank you for supporting my podcast, and if you haven't already checked out my other episodes, go have a listen. Be sure to follow my podcast, available wherever you listen, so you know when new episodes are dropped. Following really helps my podcast grow, so I appreciate your support. Stay tuned for more episodes to get a popular history of unpopular things.